um, training session. And first of all, it's basically going to be more about the le deep learning sharing session and about the neural networks. So first of all, disclaimer, I am not an expert and all these materials are actually based on personal understanding of resources that I read from the internet. And so we know that most of these materials are sourced from the open source network and are intellectual properties of professionals and the author. But this, the purpose of this is just to like for educational purpose. And therefore, another thing is like, if there's any misinterpretation in my explanation, I suggest those who are interested can go through the materials themselves online and all the links are going to be provided. Okay. So here's an overview of the topics that's going to be covered today. First of all, it's going to be a little bit brief introduction so people can be more exposed to the definitions and some basics about um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and also deep learning. And later on, we'll move on to neural networks and deep learning. And under the category of deep learning, we're going to learn more about forward propagation, backward propagation, and lastly, an overview of everything. Okay, so don't let this all intimidate you first. I'm going to go through everything simple and it's going to be um, very easy to understand. Okay, so first of all, here comes the introduction. Artificial intelligence, machine learning or ML and deep learning, DL or versus neural networks. So what are all of these? What's the differences? Okay, so basically, if we really wanted to understand the concept by relating this, we can know the first thing is like, think of them as a Russian nesting doll. Because we know that in Russian nesting doll, all of them are actually essentially a component of the prior term. So if we look at this diagram, this is called a Venn diagram. So actually a neural network, it can be seen like what we learn in mathematics. It's a subset of the deep learning. And later on the deep learning and neural networks are subset of machine learnings. And three of these are actually the subsets of a very big um, system called the artificial intelligence. So come, let's come to put this into simpler terms. So um, neural network is part of deep learning, right? So the deep learning is actually something that um, has more layers of these neural networks. And the machine learning is actually something that we call it the statistical algorithms that enable the AI, this thing to implement the data. And actually what is artificial intelligence is most importantly, why we call this artificial intelligence. Okay, here comes to the basics. So why is it called? So when we heard of the word artificial, we already know that it's actually related to thing called man-made and intelligence means smartness. So artificial here actually means that it's man-made smartness. So some um, breaking down into some of the subsets is the machine learning. So machine learning is actually the ability of the human-made algorithm to predict the future output based on the past data. So actually, this is something related to artificial intelligence because we know that we are trying to co create a computer algorithm that's trying to mimic the human intelligence. So based on that, one of the abilities that humans have is actually to predict and to make a decision based on our predictions and factors that affect it that produces the artificial intelligence. So what is deep learning? Okay, so actually it's also a subset of machine learning and we'll go more into that later. But in definition, it means that deep here means a lot of layers. And by the layers here, actually mean the neural network that we discussed before it is. Okay, and actually it's derived from machine learning. It's a part of it for more complex and more accurate predictions. Okay, so why right now deep learning is a trend that all of us have to know? So first of all, because deep learning is as, as actually quite easy, you know? It's like, we see people mention all of this in like very hard way and bombastic, but actually it saves a lot of work compared to machine learning. Because deep learning is we as the user, let's say you and me, we just prepare the data sets or we call the data and send to an algorithm. Actually, the algorithm will be run in a machine, which is basically our computer that we are using. And they will actually use that algorithm. We call it the model to learn the data sets and train it. So in fact, um, all of this theoretical thing, we you kind of understand like what they are meaning right now and how they correlate to each other. It's actually quite easy. So 
why many people doesn't really know how to implement deep learning or machine learning because the hard part is actually to code them out. Okay, why do I say this is because the coding of deep learning, like many other um, computer types, science of stuff, they have different types of framework and we have to remember different types of syntax in their own respective framework. Okay, I will give some examples later. So first of all, this is one of the example, the first example. Okay, why is it so tedious to start as a new user and a beginner on all of this field? Why it's so tedious is because there are a lot of the frameworks like aforementioned in the open market. So for example, this one is actually by using the TensorFlow code snippet to define the model. And actually you can see that this is using the TensorFlow Keras here. You can see that there's a lot of this Keras function here. So actually these are their respective syntax. So we can know that the hard part is, this is one of the example of the framework. So we can see that there's different types of this coding. Okay, that's, then let's look at another type. This is called the PyTorch code snippet to define a model. So this is the second type of algorithm. These are just two of the frameworks. There are many, a lot others. So we can see that we see a lot of this function here that we actually type in the coding are very different from the one previously that we know. So for example, when we are trying to learn deep learning and we're trying to learn a whole model and their algorithms and syntax within the framework, we have to know all of this function and it will become quite hard because they are like different and how do we integrate for them to work in each other? Like if for example, you find online, we're trying to go to GitHub and try to find those open source and try to code something like, for example, a facial recognition. But for example, the facial recognition, maybe let's say some parts of it you found op open source code, they are actually in the TensorFlow code. And another part is actually in the PyTorch code. So how do we actually, um, what's the solution for this? So then here comes some of the example. So one of the examples is this thing, Azure Machine Learning Snippet. Okay, so actually this approach, we call it the drag and drop approach. Okay, so what does it mean by drag and drop approach? And how does it actually simplify like these different frameworks to let them integrate and work with each other? So first of all, this thing, the drag and drop approach, and one of the examples, this Azure machine, it allows data processing. And actually it helps us to define the deep learning model. And you can see that actually a lot of the stuff here, you can see there's going to be train model and they have different frameworks, but you just drag and drop and they can run and they can understand each other. Thanks to some of the researchers that invented this. So one of the things is like with the help of this drag and drop machine, as long as you, the user, understand the theory and also the concept behind the deep learning and machine learning, which will be explained later, you are actually able to produce your own framework. So going on next, just now I mentioned that one of that is the Azure machine learning snippet. That is one of the example. Then this is also another example. If of you university students, some of you are quite familiar with MATLAB. They also allow a drag and drop approach. This is called as the deep network designer. And you can see there's also some functions to import and stuff like this. Okay, so this is basically an overview. So now the introduction, we are done with this part, some very simple part. Now I'm going to move next. It's towards the introduction of our neural networks, what it is and how it's related to our deep learning. Okay. Um, but before I continue, I would just like to ask like, is this speak okay? And if anyone have any questions, you guys can interrupt me when I ask you guys if it's okay. Yeah, so I assume it's okay. So now the topics to be this, um, covered under the neural network and also deep learning. So under this deep learning, there's also going to be like more specific parts that you have to understand because tomorrow and um, the third day, we are going to be having hands-on on the practices of having those um, CNN models and just for you to like know this concept better. So we are going to understand some of the simple things under the deep learning. So under forward propagation, also uh, I will explain about this more later. But under forward propagation, we are going to introduce these three things. And another stuff is the backward propagation. And there are also subtopics under it. 
Okay. So first, if you remember back to the Venn diagram we discussed earlier, it's actually the most basic or fundamental thing that we are going to discuss and later we're going to go into the deep learning. So this very basic fundamental model, it's actually something like called neural network. So if we really just um, separate the terms, neural, it means something related to neuron. Like in a human brain cell, there's something called neuron, like the science that we learned best back in secondary school. And network actually means something interconnected. So if we combine these two terms, so we are going to see this part, neuron versus artificial neurons or perceptron. So if you compare like the extract representation, right, this thing is actually our human neuron. And this thing is actually the model, the algorithm of our neural network. Actually, this is just a very basic. This is only one knot. Okay. So what do I mean by this is like one knot here, this single function is called as a neural network. Okay. So we can see that there's X1, W1, this little nucleus stuff here and Y. So actually what are all of this? Okay, so I want you all to start and imagine your human brain. Okay, just like how our hum human neuron works, this thing, X1, we just call it as an input. Okay, so when we are trying to, for example, move our fingers, this thing is something that we will send as an input, like our brain, and it will send towards this, is something called W, weight. Okay, just remember this word first, I will explain it later. So this thing will pass through and this thing here actually will activate the function and produce an output. So let's say um, we're trying to move our hand. So our brain will send an input signal and towards that part, if like some of the conditions are met and later on the output here, humans like us can actually move our hand. So this is just an extract representation. So I want you to use this concept of like the human brain neuron to actually understand like throughout the end of this neural network until deep learning part because it will be implemented to throughout. Okay, so now comes another part. So basic level of a neural network. Okay, so I'm going to use this algebraic formula here to actually explain the basic components of the neural network. Input, wakes, bias, and threshold. Okay, like what I explained earlier, this W thing is actually the wake. This X thing is called the input, and this thing is bias, called the bias. Okay, so this whole thing combined, what does this algebraic formula actually do? And what does all this term actually represent? Okay, so I will explain it later in this part. Now, I want you to use a more tangi tangible example to represent all of the terms that we learned earlier, this algebraic formula of a neural network. So this thing, the bias, also we can, some people call it as the threshold. So we are going to look at this. So imagine you are a person, right? You have your brain and you are deciding whether you're going to subscribe to a Netflix membership. So use this to understand that neural network um, formula. It's like, first of all, this thing, factors that influence your decision. These are some of the factors, okay? So first of all, the factors is kind of like, okay, if you subscribe to a Netflix membership, you will actually save time by subscribing to the services, yes or no. Okay, so actually for this part, we are going to use um, binary value for simplicity purposes. But of course, um, if you're learning deeper into the topics, there will be more like leverage sigmoid neurons representing value from negative infinity to infinite a uh, positive infinity but for simplicity purpose we are going to say yes is equal to a value of one and no equals to a value of zero okay so for example you are the user okay will you save time by subscribing to the services maybe you say yes because you save time from driving out to the cinemas and you have to like go through all those roads so you save some time so this one is actually a one because you say yes then second factor that influence your decision whether you want to subscribe to netflix is do you enjoy like premium movie quality like in the cinemas do you think that actually subscribing to this is like the same quality as in the cinemas well actually maybe you think no you can it can be either answer it depends on you but maybe you think no because the sound system in the cinemas are better 
And the third factor that influenced your decision here is actually whether you wanted to save money. So because Netflix, it really helps you to save money, you binge watch a lot of series, movies, anime at a fixed price monthly subscription, right? So it's also one. So actually all these assumed inputs here are the X values that we see earlier in this algorithmic formula. Okay, the algorithmic formula for the neural network representation. So all of these are called X. So next, we assign weights to determine the importance. Actually, what are the weights? Here are the explanation. So actually the weights here, right? The, you remember the larger the value, the value is larger, meaning like there's more single input, right? The contribution to this output will be more significant compared to this other. How you weight, meaning like if the value increases, this importance also increases. So for example, you as a person, you have your own values. You value, for example, um, save money. These are some of the decision, right? The decision factor. So you, worry, um, you value this a lot because you plan on achieving a saving goal. So this one, you give it a five. Then secondly, you value time a lot. So you give this a three. And lastly, among three of these factors, actually, you feel like the premium movie quality isn't that important because watching laptop alone is also quite good. So by using this part, we can know that this is actually equals to W. You assign a value to them. And if you look back to that equation just now, okay, this equation, there has a bias. So actually this bias, you have to assume a threshold value, the bias value of five that translate to a bias value of negative five. Um, this one, seems very intimidating because all of these are mathematical expression, but try to understand the theory behind it. Okay, not trying to intimidate you because um, just trying to understand this whole thing will really help you. And to be honest, when you're trying to code later, you don't have to understand too much about it because if you really have to understand how all, everything works, like the functions and stuff, that will mostly be more towards when you're going to do research in this topic or you're going to be R&D and engineer or something like that. So. These are just some of the basic concept. Okay, so we plug those values into the algorithmic formula that we see just now. Okay, so if we look back to this image here, actually there's going to be an activation function. Okay, so what do I mean by activation function is, um, the activation function means that this neuron, this neuron here will be activated. How do we mean by activated? Okay, let's look at the diagram. It's, almost something like this, right? This is the weight, this is the input. Okay, so for example, if we have all of this thing plus together, plus the bias value, which you can see that this is our calculation. So actually we call this thing also as Y hat, meaning the predicted outcome. This is more technical terms when you are looking through some research journal or papers, we call this thing as Y hat, meaning our predicted outcome in the model whether to subscribe to the Netflix membership. So if we calculate and substitute all the value inside this one and this one and substitute everything plus this bias value, we get a value of eight. So this activation function is to really tell us like whether this knot here is going to be activated or not. Okay, so this thing, for example, eight, we let it, this activation function to be larger or uh, larger than or equal to zero, then it will be activated. But if it's smaller, it will not be activated. So for example, our example here is actually activated. So meaning I will subscribe to the Netflix membership. So why this activation function is quite important? Actually, this will be introduced in the deep learning part because they are all correlated. So how is it correlated? So first of all, this deep learning is actually a lot of these nodes here this single neural network, like we multiply it, we have a lot of it. So for example, this is a single basic one, right? But if we have a lot, which will be shown here, this is like a lot of it, a lot of it. So you can see that with a lot of these nodes, actually there's, this is actually called as a deep learning model already. And why we need the activation function is for example, when it is actually activated, this knot will send this data next to the next layer. But for example, if it's not like activated, meaning the threshold value here, this value, 
is less than zero, meaning it's not activated, the data will actually not pass through the next layer and the next layer, and finally, um, it will not go through like here to the output layer. Okay, so now this is some of the um, basic things to know about our predicted outcome and actually what is the neural network. Okay, so now the neural network, this is just a mind map, a very brief one. We will go through this one by one very briefly. So we are going to talk about activation functions, cost functions, gradient descent, and something called the normalization. So uh, this part, we'll go through it one by one, so don't let this scare you. Okay, so next, here is the layers. Because why do we need so many layers like this diagram I show here in the deep neural network? It's because basically this part, the layers of the neural network, right? Um, we have to com um, actually handle more complex problems because in real world, like all of us know, it's not something like just, oh, I make a decision and everything ends. It also has other different problems that are not just like single decision can be made. For example, you have different factors to actually put into the function. You have a lot of the influences that have to take into account. So therefore, we have to build something that is more in depth. So actually, the deep learning here, the deep part, actually means deep neural network. Actually, deep means a lot layers in a neural network. So another thing you have to take note is that if more than three layers inclusive of this input and output is actually considered as a deep learning. So actually this one is also considered as a deep learning. Okay, so this thing, now imagine, imagine like just now that process, right? The single process being repeated and it will actually come up with this thing called as the deep learning, right? To rephrase everything. So another important part is as there's only a single input here, this row, um, called. Oh, sorry, column of input and a column of output. There's a lot of columns of these layers here. So actually this thing is something we call as the hidden layers. So all hidden layers actually have their own activation function, passing information right from these um, previous types of layers to the next one. So how does it pass? If you remember, it's because of the activation function and it actually um, um, is bigger than the threshold value, so therefore it can pass through the next layer. Okay, so now this is an overview just now. Now look in an example of convolutional neural network. Okay, you might be confused. Just now I mentioned about something called these neural networks, or uh, I even call it like artificial neurons, ANN. This means artificial neural network. Actually, um, artificial neural network means that it's some of like mimicking the human brain. Like they wanted to mimic how we think and stuff. And when it comes to the word convolutional, it's like the deep learning network is used for the process of actually processing images, the task of processing images. Okay, so we learned about a lot of theories and concepts just now. Currently, we're going to look at an example of the cat versus dog classification with 98.7% accuracy and some of those data sets you can find online. So how does it do? Using the concept that we learned just now, we're going to input an image. This is going to be the input, right? And also this part is going to be the wake. And after that, it will go through some layers, activation function, and they will have convolutional layers, pooling layers fully collected layers, etc. This one we will learn more, but I won't talk about a lot of this in today's session because the time is quite limited. But finally, the output, it's quite important to determine this image because why do we send just an image into this algorithm or our model to train it? There's definitely a function, right? That is to predict the outcome. So um, we can actually see these examples in our daily life already, like Google, when you're trying to sign in or out of your email every single time, they will ask you like, oh, to verify whether you're a human and stuff. You actually have to select those image, right? So actually, when you're selecting, how does the system like in Google know that we are doing it right or wrong? Because they also implement this whole neural network, convolutional neural network to determine whether the things that we select is the correct one. So for example, this one, the input image, they want us to select a cat, then we select it correctly. Then it will go on to an output of like, oh, you are a human, you are verified. Okay, 
So just now I talked about a lot of the layers, like multiple layers inside this deep learning. So how do these layers actually work? So looking at this part, it's going to be layer by layer of process. So this is an example. Like even when we are playing around Instagram, Snapchat, all of those uh, applications, social media, companies actually use them right to um, cater better to our market right now. So one of these things that we actually are interested in is like the facial recognition. So how does it work? It's like actually first layer, they kind of like know some of your angles. Maybe let's call this like the features, right? The features line here. So they are going to recognize and for example, activated, they know that, oh, this is a human line. This is not a bear or a dog. Then they go on to the next layer and the next layer. And finally, the output is like it can scan your whole face. Okay, so one important thing is like this thing, if for like normal types of image processing, actually we have to do all the steps manually, part by part, analysis by human intervention, which is something that will be covered in machine learning later on, but it will only touch on a little in this session today. But this CNN convolutional neural network actually do all the work for you. It's like you just throw in the data sets of human faces and they will actually run the algorithm and try to determine it for you, whether this is a human. So it actually is easy, like mentioned before, it saves a lot of time and effort. And it is actually reproducible for a lot of images. It's not like you have to put an image and then they're going to distinguish the feature one by one and you put another image, your machine's going to start the process all over again. No, they will just know that this will be a human face and they know that what features or characteristics and labels to look for to know that you are a human. So this CNN here will actually extract this part here, which it extracts all the features automatically for us because how they do it, they define the layers or we call it the activation function that we discussed earlier. Okay, so some of these, um, activation function is like the approach to really detect let's for, say for example an image of a cat so what are the characteristics or label that this machine learning oh sorry this deep learning actually look for so some of these examples are actually for, let's say you are a researcher you're trying to fit this image into the model so first of all the characteristics maybe you are going to detect it like the cat ears those shapes and stuff and another thing is like maybe the roundness of their face or maybe that's like the presence of a whisker. So all of these are actually characteristics and you're going to put it like labels, actually labels for something like these layers, the CNN, to distinguish and actually go into the activation function to like produce different types of output. Okay, so that's a simplicity of everything. So now here comes to a mathematical model like this is a example that you can try to train based on what we previously discussed so like the x1 i told you before this one is the values of inputs and this one is the wake okay so this actually is the summation actually there's going to be plus bias value but to keep everything simple here um I'm going to like ignore that fact, but this thing is actually all the algebraic function of our neural network. And they will pass through this activation function. This thing is a sigmoid activation function, which that we will discuss in depth later. And then what does this do? It's like from what we discussed earlier, they will pass everything, the probability, the inputs, the wakes, and they will pass through it. And later they will pass through like whether the the value produced actually fulfill the threshold value. And if it fulfill, it will come to a type of output. And if it doesn't fulfill, it goes to another type of output, like similar to our human brain, like how everything function. Like for example, your hand is like hurt, so you cannot really move it. So those are different types of output, but if your hand are healthy, they will also have different types of output. So this is one of the examples. Okay, so, that is actually a very short summary of what we are going to look at into the neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and also deep learning. Okay, so now here comes an example that I want all of you to try using the formula that we learned, which is this one. 
I want you all to try and calculate the value that you're going to get for this part and also this, the activation function. Okay, this thing. Okay, I'm going to give you all a break around, um, let's say, uh, five minutes and later I will continue back and we're going to compare the answer and help you to deafen your like knowledge in this part. Okay, so I will leave for now, but if you guys have any questions, you can definitely comment in the Google Meet. Okay, everyone, I'm back. It's already five minutes. So before we head on to the next session, like 
um, to delve deeper into this concept, I want to check like if does any of you like have the correct answer for this? Maybe you can leave the answer down below and let's compare. Definitely, uh, don't be shy. Oh, okay, sorry. I saw in the comment section by Zixing Lim, uh, explain a bit on what is bias and how to set them. Okay, uh, actually for this part, um, this bias, right? Wait, let me search. Uh, currently, I don't have any hands-on um, to show you about the bias. Maybe tomorrow when um, two of my uh, other members from the IELTS team, they are going to show you the um, hands-on regarding the media pipe and CNN, regarding the cats and dogs and stuff. And therefore, you can try to see how all of this works. But um, today, I'm going to move more on the theory part. Sorry. Uh. OK, so anyone wants to leave their question, uh, answer down below regarding that part? No? Uh, am I going too fast? If you guys think like, you want me to rephrase on something or go back to a few slides, I also can do that. And uh, if no, OK, no one will leave the answer. OK, I will just proceed. OK, so now we are going to look at it. Actually, it is quite simple. This whole functions and stuff, the inputs, the weights, you're just going to like multiply everything. So just like the function that we learned earlier, to simplify everything, we're not going to put the bias here. But this is actually the input, the weight. And how we multiply is like, you first see that this is like a chain reaction here. This part, chain reaction, it's actually forward. This part is like forward, and this part is linked here. You can see that the arrow is all forward direction. So you can see that this thing is actually multiplied, like this value, the input value is multiplied by the wake. And this also multiplied, and also this one multiplied by it. So we will get the algebraic sum here. So here, if we just put it into a calculator, the value will be 0 0.66. Okay, so we substitute this value, the z value here, this one, into the activation function, this part. So once we substitute inside, we can see that actually we get this number. So this is one of the probabilities of the outputs. Then this one, if for example, it really does meet the bias or threshold value, it will actually pass on to the next layer and the next layer until like all the layers are done and come to a final output. Okay, so this is just a very simple brief example, but I hope like it really helps you to strengthen your concept on it. Okay, so this activation function, why does it look like that? Oh, it looks very hard, but don't worry, I'll just briefly explain it later. Okay, so basically what you did just now in that example that you calculated, you have successfully completed a forward propagation of the deep learning. So what is forward propagation? Okay, I will distinguish this a better later, but basically this thing that you see, the arrow part, this one is in a forward direction, going here and here. And for example, it passed through the activation function, like that's going to be an output. It will pass through a next layer and the next layer and will forwardly propagate until a final output. So we can see that this thing is actually a simple concept, what you did just now. It's like a very small node here. We call this thing a node of the neural network. You successfully done one of it. But what if it comes to a real world problem, like what we discussed just now, it's going to be very complicated. There's going to be a lot of layers. So this thing, okay, this forward propagation is actually this stuff. Wow, it looks very hard. It looks scary. You don't know how to like actually interpret it. But um, to, to be honest, this thing, you don't have to know so much if you are just going to train data sets and models. But actually just knowing the fundamentals of it will be like sufficient to be honest. So this part here is actually, if we're looking at it, this W is actually the weight. So actually what is W1? Okay, then we look at this thing. Because just now, as I said, when all the real world problems are go get going to be like more complex, there's going to be like different types of weights and inputs. Okay, so we just have to understand that this T here is the transpose, the meaning of transpose, this X here is going to be the input and this W here is actually the weight. So this is the first function, second, third, 
form. So if we use this image, this diagram on the left here, and we compare it with this function on the right. So the first one, one here, is actually that equals to Z2. So what is Z2? It's actually this weight here. Let's see. OK, this weight here times this part, the X1 input. This times the transpose. And this output here, actually, we call it Z2. So now we know the first function. OK, so the forward propagation second function, this A2 here, Actually, it will be activated and something, they will do something here in the algorithm in the model, like based on what type of model you're training. And this A2 here will actually pass through this like stuff here. This G, Z here, oh, sorry, this G here uh, is actually something called as the activation function, right? Actually, actually going to pass through that part. So this same thing, this Z, uh, sorry, this G here, the activation function, it's going to be like passed through another thing. Um, sorry, it will be passed through like many times here because if you see right, the third part W two is actually this part times this A two. It will pass through this A three. Uh, become this Z right, Z three. So actually, this Z3 will pass through here again. Actually, this one is equals to the A3 activation function. This final value for prediction, right? So basically, if uh, to put everything easier, this first one, this first function here, you multiply by the input, the transpose of the weight, and you get a Z. Then this Z, you go through an activation function. And this thing, the final value from this layer of activation function is actually, we call this as A2. Then this A2, for example, the output we call, um, successfully passed through the threshold or bias value, it will go through the next layer. This is just a single node. There's going to be a lot, right? So they will go through a specific next layer, and this one will multiply by their transpose of the weight 2, like what we did with weight 1, and it will actually become this Z3, like the one that we do the algorithmic sum of the neural network, right? This thing over here. Then it will also pass through another activation function to predict the final value, the output. OK, so this is basically, it looks very complicated. But if you try to understand it, don't try to like do too hard to yourself. And yeah, you can basically understand what it is. So OK, the activation function here, the G, the G here is actually this part. For this example, it is called the sigmoid. Actually, there's different types, but this is one of the examples discussed called a sigmoid activation function. So actually, this thing, this is what the shape will look like. So why we will have this shape? Why is it not like this shape? Like this is something we learned like maybe in engineering, so we'll learn it ab like about it. This call a like, what is that called? I like guess step input, right? Why is it not like that? So, OK, I will discuss about that later too. So like to make this whole thing easier is like this activation function, like what I show you with the um, Netflix subscription example. Actually, if the, it passed through the threshold value, this prediction, the output will be either high or low. So meaning like this one, it will go to the next layer. This one will not. OK, nice. So now we go into like look at the examples of the activation function that I mentioned so many times just now. like you already look through the sigmoid, right? So what is actually this activation function? The most important is like they modify the data they receive, right? Before passing it through the layer, like what they will act as, maybe you can think it like a gatekeeper, whether it pass through a certain like qualification for it to move, move next. So like the one I discussed just now, our real life situations are not linear, not always black and white. There will be different colors in between and there are some gray zones, right? Between black and white. So that's the main reason we need this activation function to like act as a gatekeeper for what thing to pass through to the next layer. So some commonly used activation functions, if you want to know more about it, you can go to this website link, like um, in the Google Slides that I sent you guys earlier. You guys can go here and learn more about it. OK, so now continuing. Like what I try to mention, like not all real life situations are nonlinear. Like, you can't really, um, it's like not everything in life is always like, this is the value of one. Let's say this is the value of zero, right? 
in a graph. This is zero and this is one. Not everything is here. That's definitely going to be a gray zone. Like one straight line, you cannot just say like, oh, this one, I separate it already. Okay, it's either just no or yes. It's not something as simple as this. Because let's see for this example. You can see that in this part, this one is dot, like red dots. There's two like cluster here. And there's another two cluster of like um, cross, but it's blue color, blue cross. And they actually represent different types of data. So these two categories of data here are actually very different. And we cannot just like draw a single line like, oh, I draw it like this, it's separated. Eh? But there's still like other categories. Then I draw it like this. Oh, it's still not separated. Then I draw it like this or this. It's still not separated, right? Even if I draw it like this, it's not separated. So it is actually not very efficient. So how do we actually separate this part? So it is not possible to use a straight line. Therefore, we have to use something called as the activation function. So this is something called as the nonlinear example. So what is this nonlinear example? It's act meaning like it's not just a single line. That's like to fully actually categorize them, maybe you need two lines or maybe in other examples where that every data set, it gets more clustered. It's not just as simple as just like red or blue. You need more lines, right? So they become nonlinear and more complex. So therefore, we need this activation function. And another example of why we need it is like not why linear condition is not practical other than this cluster thing that I show here. Okay, for example, you are like studying right now or you're working and you have a salary, but your salary would determine whether you wanted to buy a car or not. But it's only salary the main factor that affects like whether you are able to buy a car, whether you're able to afford it, you're going to get a loan. Well, it's not the main factor that influences it, if we really remember. Because you see, in this category, let's say there are different people, like different cluster. If we really just put everything into like a linear stuff, it's either zero or one, meaning no or yes. Okay, let's look at the strange part. This thing here, this person have 20,000. Like, let's say this is their annual salary. They can't buy a car, um, maybe it's okay. Maybe it makes sense. And they have 65K, okay, it makes sense. Maybe they are afford, like able to afford because like there's a very big pay gap here. But if we look at this example, this, this person here, they have 49,000 and like 49,000 annual income and 51. Actually, this difference is only around 2,000. Then how can you just say like, oh, they have like an annual income of 49,000 but they cannot buy a car. Maybe they have like good financial planning or they have like other factors. Maybe they um, inherit some money from other people. Then how can you just say that this person cannot buy a car? And 51,000, how can you just say that, oh, this definitely, this person already hit the threshold value. They can buy a car. How can you be so firm? Maybe there are other factors like this person actually are in debt and stuff. So not everything is like quite linear in our real life. It's not practical. So you can see that this is the function that I discussed. Like this is the value. The y axis value here is zero. This one is one. Like how can you just say that this one represents? So actually we need to have some tolerance value here. Tolerance meaning like there's some probability value here. So actually this is where the activation function comes in. Like the sigmoid function that we discussed earlier. So actually, what does this sigmoid function do? It's like, for example, this here, 49,000, the person earning it, and another person earning 51,000. These two people here, they're going to have like this 2K transition, right? We are actually going to have like a tolerance value. This tolerance value is like taken into account to actually allow this activation function, this thing here, for a more linear rule. So meaning like, if you remember, this one is called a step input type of shape of graph. We actually give it a tolerance, right? Meaning it, it becomes like this. That's a probability over this part. So you can see that this thing actually allows a range of probabilities. You see this? There are different types of possibility. If you remember in statistics, this part, the pop, uh, like all the summations of the probabilities equals to one. 
So there are different types of possibility. Maybe there are other factors affecting it and stuff. So it's not like just, oh, yes or no. So that's why we need to use activation function to actually allow a gray zone or there's a tolerance value. It's not like absolute to actually be more lenient to allow those changes and factors taken into account. So this one is also quite popular. This sigmoid function in deep learning back in the days is actually quite popular. So other than this, there's also another type called a hyperbolic tangent. So this is actually quite similar to the sigmoid function. But if you look through and compare this, the y-axis, this one allows a probability of like um, 0 to 1. But this one, it allows a probability of negative 1 to positive 1. So they have different types of value. But I'm not going to go in depth. It's just an introduction about different types of activation function. And other than that, these two, there's also another type called the ReLU. I believe like a lot of us, especially right now, when if you're really into deep learning, you will definitely learn or heard or at least read about this term in some of the scholarly articles online. So this ReLU is actually quite famous among our researchers right now. So that's why you read quite common, like constantly reading about it. So why is it good? OK, so one of the main reasons of why is it good is because this computational cost is not very big, it's small. So it doesn't burden our machine too much. So actually, what I'm talking about, like the deep learning and this stuff, like we fit the data sets. Where do we fit it to? We actually fit into our machine, meaning like our laptop. We are going to use some softwares like to run those algorithms. And we fit these data sets into it. And if we run the activation function of ReLU, it doesn't actually burden it that much. So how do you know like you're looking at a ReLU? Actually, the shape is quite similar to what we call as a RAM, RAM, uh, RAM input. The RAM input is basically like when the data here, the x-axis, is zero, a uh, negative value. It basically means that this probability or the y here is going to be zero. But when it is starting to be like 0, 1, 2, 3 positive in the x-axis value, we will actually have uh, the value same as the input. It's like directly proportional to it. So this is what we are going to introduce as the ReLU. OK, so this thing here, another thing for like this um, activation function is a um, softmax. So Actually, softmax, if you see it, it, it feels kind of like complicated, right? Uh, compared to the other ones. It's because uh, we're going to discuss more about this in our topics later in the back propagation stuff. And actually, what does this thing do? It actually helps to categorize problems, the type of problems. OK, so actually, like what we say in image right now, the convolutional neural network, the CNN, Actually, it helps in categorizing the type of problem like images that we see just now. The images, there will be different types. For example, like um, dog, cat, and human, for example. It will actually help us to categorize this. So how does it do it? So if we're looking at it, this thing is actually uh, a bit confusing. Actually, this one is the Z, right? The logic score, the summation of the neural network. Actually, this thing, if we take the values of this Z, before the activation function, then we put it into this activation function using the softmax. This softmax is actually something um, that will produce a probability. OK, this part, this part, um, I won't explain about it. It's just that you know it will produce a set of probabilities. And why does this set of probability matters? Is because, like I said just now, in the convolutional neural network CNN, when you are feeding these images inside, it will actually calculate like the also like the thing I say, like when you log out and log in of your Google account, they'll actually like tell you to select an image to verify your human. How do they know the probability of the things you're selecting are correct or wrong? It's because um, they actually use this softmax, one of the examples of application, and they calculate this probability. For example, they tell you to select the cat, right? So maybe the probability of the cat always select is like 0 0.7, this one is 0 0.1, this one is 0 0.2. So these are a set of probabilities. And like aforementioned, all of these probabilities, like statistics that we learn, the summation of everything is going to be 1. So meaning like, for example, they want you to select a cat. And this 0 0.7 means that it is 70% sure 
that it's an image of cat if you select it. Okay, so next, how this activation function actually helps. So, okay, this is actually a sigmoid example. After the data that we said just now is fed into those like activation function, the neural networks and stuff, this one is how it will like become. So after processing it, like the data, we calculate the input x, oh, sorry, looks very ugly, the input x and weight w, it will pass through the activation function. They pass through the activation function, let's call it just s, uh, sigmoid, sigmoid. And then they pass, they will output this thing, they will get the shape. So you can see that after passing through the input uh, activation function, this thing is actually linearly separable already. You see that initially when we look at this part, it is clustered together, it doesn't help. But once you like separate the values here into the activation function, it actually categorize them, then it follows the shape of the sigmoid. And you can just draw a line to actually categorize. Maybe there's some error here or loss, but that's still okay because it's definitely better than before. So this is how activation function helps in deep learning. Okay, so to so see another stuff, it's like this one is like, okay, let's look back at the set example of the salary, the guy with 49K and the guy with like 51K. So you can see that rather than this thing that we discussed earlier, like just zero and one binary absolute value, we allow this tolerance range for the probabilities. Then therefore, we can actually get this part. It's like, all of these are kind of using our mathematical expression function. But the most important part is like why it use this. Like this one is the n, uh, this one is n, and this one is r. Why do they use this? Because by using probability, right, you just have to understand that activation function uses this type of things like probability and all these functions to establish quite a complex relationship between two events. So like by car, not by car, it, it's not simple. So it's like establishing a complex relationship of them. And by using one of the activation function, for example, sigmoid to help do this. So this thing actually helped us. You just have to understand something like that. Okay, so this is how the neural network works. So remember this mind map that we discussed just now? It looks very complicated, right? But you just uh, actually successfully understand activation function and why we do, why we are going to use this and represent non-linearities like the sigmoid hyperbolic tangent, the ReLU and softmax, okay? Sigmoid, um, something like this. This one is hyperbolic tangent, the ReLU and the softmax to categorize like different prob probabilities. Okay, then moving on next, we're going to actually look at this thing. Uh, it's called the loss function or cost function. This one, we already done it. Now the cost function. Okay, so we are going to basically just focus on a few one, which is mainly MSE and cross entropy. Okay, so this is also part of the forward propagation. So it's part of the forward propagation. Okay, if you forgot, the input passed through the wake, the input passed through the wake, passed through activation function, let's call it sigmoid, and that's going to produce an output, right? So this whole thing is in a forward direction. So this is called as the forward propagation. So the purpose, why do we use this loss function is to tell us the performance of this model because even though we have like different types of outputs and stuff, how do we know that it's correct? How do we know that it's actually um, doing what we want it to do? Is it like the actual outcome equals to the predicted outcome that we want? So this is how by doing it, like aforementioned, difference between the predicted outcome and the actual output. Okay, so what does these two mean? Okay, so um, let's say, for example, I'm going to give like an example. Uh, okay example of past year question. Okay, we're going to use this example throughout the session. So for example, taking an analog of whether you're going to sit for an exam, like we are all students or even like you are working right now, you're actually going to sit for some exam for some professional certs and validations. So how do you like when you're trying to sit for it, 
you're going to do some practice, right? You're going to find like open source codes, those learning, or even back in SPM days, we're going to buy those exercise or pass year book to do it. So then we're going to have like two stuff. One is like, we are actually doing our answers. Then we cross check it with the answer scheme. And another one is like, we're actually doing this, but we are not crossing, like cross check it with the answer scheme. So how do you improve your performance in like, the output, meaning like your grades, your results. So basically, in if you're doing like those past year questions and you're comparing it to your answer scheme, you're actually going to be more uh, motivated. And therefore, you can know like, oh, this part, I'm going to do it like this to get the best results. Oh, this part I actually see in the past year on some of the seniors or some of the other people. Oh, so I just answer like this and I can get like full marks. But if you don't have the answer scheme, you're just blindly doing it again and again and you don't know whether you're doing it right or wrong. So this is why this loss or cost function is going to tell us the difference between the prediction, what we expect and the actual output, the answer scheme. So this is our prediction and our answer scheme. So this computing, the probability of the each of these category. So why do how do you know like what is the actual output here like for example of the past year question you have answer scheme as the actual output but to be honest when you are trying to do like deep learning and trying to implement the models and algorithms usually the data sets that we find online they comes with the actual output because um when we're trying to train the data right it's trying to make your computer or data set uh, sorry to make your algorithm the deep learning algorithm to basically compare and improve its performance. Therefore, they, are, they usually have a data that lets you compare. Like, okay, for example, like the cat image, the cat that we discussed earlier, the cat image. Actually, when we are downloading this cat and dog, for example, cat and dog deep learning model that will be uh, hands, having hands on in the second or third day in this training session. It actually comes with a label that tells the characteristic of cat. So what does this label to, right? They tell the characteristics of the cat. For example, like we discussed, like they have whiskers or not, whether the ears are like this shape and the body is this shape, the eyes, like the diameter, there's the certain features, like the length between certain features of the cat's like face. So actually it tells the model that, okay, it actually have these features. If it have it, it is actually a, a cat. So our machine is going to produce a prediction based on the actual output because that data set, the actual output is going to tell like, oh, if it have this label, then it is what, what, what. And our machine will actually learn from this label and the data set to predict the output. And therefore, we can actually know the performance because we can check, right, when we're running it in your machine, the data set, when you run it, for example, you put like cat image inside and the output like, in the end, it actually re recognizes it after the CNN. They know that this is a cat. So you know that, oh, this performance is okay. So two of the very commonly function of the use, uh, use loss function, commonly use loss function, like discussed earlier, we're going to focus on MSE and cross entropy. So the difference, you just have to know that the mean square error MSE is prediction related to numbers, whereas the cross entropy is for the prediction related to classifications. Okay, so let's look at this part. This is actually what we call as a loss function plot. Okay, so if you want to like remember it better, just remember this, this thing, the y, x, y, z axis that we learned in like mathematics. So let's say this is x, y, and this is z. This is, we call it the vertical axis vertical plane axis. Oh, sorry, this is just an axis. And this X and Y, they form a plane, right? They form like a surface here. So this part, we call it the horizontal part. So actually what they do is like the loss function, this whole thing actually is like a 3D. So this, actually what is the value of X and Y, the horizontal part? You just have to remember that this horizontal part is actually equals to the weights, the weights. So, but why is there like one weight, two weights? Are they even the same value? Actually, they have different values. And why do we have the combination of different values? 
is because uh, they will help in producing the loss of the model. And we will look like more in detail later. There's going to be like diagram examples. Okay, so if we look at this thing, this thing, we implement this concept that we learn. This is actually the weights, right? You see the horizontal. And there's going to be something like predicting like the vertical axis. This is going to be the loss. So this part of the loss, right, will actually be like the calculated values. Okay, so this thing, this contour lines, we can see that um, actually the examples here, like we said before, why we have different horizontal weights, like this, this weight thing, is because different weights produce different loss scopes. So how? It's like, okay, I told you already, right? The X here, that's going to be, for example, weight one, we call it W1. This uh, Y part, we call it W2. And they are going to be like, go through something, maybe multiply or stuff. And they are going to produce different, different spots on this area. We call this as a terrain. Or even some people like to call it as uh, the contour because it looks like a contour, right? If you look at Google Maps. So you can see that there's going to be like sinkholes, ups and down. So these two different weights will produce different values on here by combinations, like different combinations that you can see the star they draw. So they will actually produce different things called score. We call this thing here, mini things here, called scores. And they are actually comparable with the solution or the actual output. And okay, this whole thing here, this terrain that you see just now, you can see like close up, there's going to be like a little sinkhole, this part. They actually have meaning that I will explain further on later. Okay, so now we talk about loss or cost function. This is the first one that we said just now, mean square error. Okay, this one, another mathematical thing, but don't let it intimidate you because it's actually the same thing as the name of it, MSE. So the Y here is actually the actual output, the passier question, the answer scheme here. This is the answer scheme. And the predicted output is like our predicted outcome, like our predicted results and our like answer. So this thing just negative, like subtract it. Then this whole thing here is actually called the error. If you remember in science, we want to find like the percentage of error. We take the actual minus like the predicted. Then we square, then we square the whole stuff. Then meaning, means meaning like this end here, means like the training samples in each mini, mini batch. So what we mean by train, like uh, actually train, right? It's just that, we put the model to actually familiarize itself with like the algorithms and stuff to train and have a better performance. Because um, why do we train it? It's like we are going to adjust certain things inside these algorithms to make it like having better performance. So this will also be like touched on later. But let's look at just this part. So it's actually just the whole thing divided by this N. Then we are going to produce the MSE. Actually. Um, MSE, there's also going to be something called like mini batch or like just um, training samples. Actually, you just have to remember like training samples is this one, the mini batch is like outside. And the training samples are just like parts of a mini batch. Okay, so coming here, this is like examples. Okay, this is actually a part of the example of samples. So inside a mini batch, these are the samples. And we are going to implement this MSE. So we can see that the number of sample here is 3, n equals to 3, if you remember. Then the whole thing here, 144, how do we get it? Okay, I will just take one example, actual minus predicted. So you get this part. So then you square it. Then this whole value here, you sum it, sum the whole thing, and divide it by this um, training sample, the n here. So you get this value. Okay, you get the value, but oh my God, it's so big, it's so large. You see that the value here is actually 52.3. Actually, this value is very large. So what we are, like the purpose that we say to train the model is to actually minimize this error or the loss value. So, okay, that will also be covered later. But um, how we do it is actually by changing the answer, like changing the weights, the weights, and it will be discussed later. Okay, 
So another type of loss or cost function that we discussed is called a cross entropy. So how does this do? So normally used together with the softmax, the one that I discussed just now, like the, they produce probability. Okay, sigmoid, sigmoid, uh, ReLU, and another one is hyperbolic tangent. And the last one, the fourth one is softmax. So this thing here, actually, like we remember, softmax actually produce a relation to the probability based on the logic score, right? And the summation of them all is one. So we can see that we are also going to use a formula. This one will be used a lot in our training session today. So we can see that the most important part, it looks very complicated, but you just have to remember this and the log function. Okay, so first of all, just that you remember, the P1 is the actual probability, actual probability, like the answer scheme, if you remember the past year question example. And the Q1 is actually the predicted probability so h is actually the loss the loss that we calculated using this cross and uh, cross entropy loss function okay so we are going to use this loss function to cal calculate or evaluate answer for a certain case okay so moving on next why do i call you to remember like the negative and log so if you remember this graph this is a normal log graph so for cross entropy loss this thing actually is a negative loss graph. So you can see that it's actually um, just uh, inverted in the x axis. So basically, the cross entropy loss function has this shape. Okay, but uh, definitely it's here in the positive side yet. So you just remember this first, it will be discussed later. Okay, so now comes an example. Okay, before I proceed, let me drink some water. Okay, so now this is an example. And we're going to learn something here called, um, actually you don't have to remember, it's just know that there's something like this exists in actually, especially I think um, engineering students should know like one hot encoding, we're going to learn it in the digital system or already learn it. So in this subject, we're going to be introduced to the one hot encoding. So to make this simpler for anyone that doesn't know this, it's like this label here, Actually, these things is going to be have like one, two, three, four, five. They have five bits. These five bits over here. So actually, one hot, you just remember one of it is high. High meaning like in digital terms, meaning like one. One of them is one, right? You remember one is like something activated. Zero is not activated. So one of them is activated. So for example, we let this encoding five bits, right? The dock, the hot, one hot encoding, the one is positioned in the um, fifth bit. And this one is positioned in the fourth bit. This one is position is the three, two, uh, uh, the, eh? sorry. Oh, and the first bit, sorry. And uh, I'll just use this like for a simple representation. So it's quite simple and easy, right? You just have to remember like just one of it, one output here is active in the forward propagation neuron when the image is speed. So meaning like, um inside of this image feed into our deep learning model, there's actually going to be like uh, calculations and stuff. And later, one of them will be activated, meaning like, oh, they determine this image to be a dog or they determine this image to be a fox, for example. Okay, so let's say we fit this data, the deep learning model with a dog's image. So this dog image, the probability of distribution, right, of the first image being 1.0, because we personally, our model, um, let's say we personally know that it's correct. And at the same time, our model, meaning like our machine, the algorithm running, also predicted it correctly, accurately. So it predicts that, oh, this is definitely a one. So you can see like this is the one hot encoding of this part. So they know that this is like accurate. But coming to this part, if you remember, the P1, the P here, is our actual probability, what we know, we as the user. We as the user definitely know that this is an image of dog. But we humans have like better making like intelligence, right? We are good like at interpreting things, but our machine isn't. So maybe our machine come up with like probability, like this is the predicted outcome. They have different sets. For example, if you remember this part, the dog, 
fox, horse, eagle, squirrel. Actually, this one represents dog, horse, uh, eh, fox, horse, eagle, squirrel. So all of these things will have a distribution calculated by the softmax function because softmax is definitely for this uh, like counting the probability and categorizing stuff. So you can see that all of this, the probability will have a summation of one. Okay, so we can see that among all of this, the highest probability here because we fit this deep learning, the example that we use is the image of a dog, right? So this one actually have a higher value of probability, but 0.4 is actually not very accurate because you see the image of a fox is having a percentage of 0.3, meaning like it's not very good, right? Because to be confirmed that it's very good, usually it's going to be like 90% or 90 plus plus, or even in some of the models we see in like open source codes on GitHub's, they have like, maybe like security types of um, purpose, they are going to have like the better, the accuracy, the better it is, right, to protect like user's privacy. So usually some of them will have like, um, sorry, like to 99%, I, I even saw this example before, like in previous training models. So how do we improve it? So this thing, how do we do it is by using, if you remember, the this part the cross entropy loss, use this function. So actually we are going to substitute this. If you remember this thing, negative, then lock for the prediction. So you're going to know that this P is the um, accurate one. What we know that it's correct, the answer scheme. So we are going to substitute here. Then lastly, this one will be the predicted outcome from our model, our um, deep learning model. And actually if you multiply and plus the whole stuff, this thing inside the bracket, you get this part and actually have like, let's say um, 0 0.91. So the cross entropy loss here, which means 0 0.916, it is quite high, you know, because it's very close to one, meaning like um, it's not that accurate. So let's look at another example. So we are going to calculate this together to save time. So. Let's say if we actually, like, how do we improve it by changing weights, right? Actually, discuss here. How do we minimize this part is to change the weight of the deep learning process. Then uh, after we do that, that's going to, like, have different predicted outcomes. Then, for example, we input the image, like we said, it's actually image of a dog. So after we improve our whole, like, the, uh, the model, actually, this predicted outcome for a dog becomes 0.98%. So meaning like it's quite accurate because if you remember the previous one is like 0 0.4, 0 0.3, not so accurate. So how do we calculate it? So we use this cross entropy loss function again. Oh, sorry. And then we substitute all the values inside. Negative, this summation, calculate, you see, this part has changed, right? Because our model has definitely improved its performance. So we calculate this value, negative log 0 0.98. And finally, we get this thing, the value to be this cross entropy loss, right? Meaning the loss of like, let's say loss of data is quite low compared to what we have here. So meaning like this, your performance of your model is actually improved. So meaning it's like something very good. Okay, so if you guys did follow and you try to use your calculator and calculate, actually if you use this uh, negative log 0 0.98, it doesn't equals to 0 0.02. Does anyone know why and want to try to answer? There's actually um, some reasoning behind this part. So if you use just like using your calculator and you type the most common log inside, you will actually get 0 0.008774. It's not equals to this value. Okay, so one of the most basic explanation is even though um, this thing here, we use the normal log as example, but in this example, we're actually using another type of log. Okay, so why are we using another type of log? Actually, it depends on the situation. Like we mentioned right now, we are learning about deep learning, but in machine learning, right? Um, base E, natural log, uh, sorry, loan is actually base E, right? Base E are more used in machine learning because why is it? It's like uh, machine learning application use the base e logarithm, right, for implementation convenience. Um, because um, 
it's more easier for it to calculate and there are also other reasonings behind but if you're more interested you can definitely search it online and there are also other bases for example log 10 and log 2 and log 2 is quite often to be used um, to explain the information entropy concept but in this example here actually this one um, is taken for an example of a machine learning so we are actually using log e base uh, e so actually this one is loan so negative loan 0 0.98 we get the answer of uh, 0 0.0202 which is this part so this one uh when you are doing true deep learning, you do have to like pay attention to the type of base they use and they have their own reasonings for that, of course. Okay, so now, uh, does anyone like have any questions thus far? If no, I'm going to move into topics about like forward propagations and backward propagations. And you guys can open the mic to um, disturb me. Okay. So I hope everyone is clear thus far. Oh, thank you for paying attention until now. So now, all we discuss regarding the neural network activation function and loss function is all in forward propagation, meaning like going in front. It's not like going backwards. Okay, so what do we mean by this thing, backward propagation? Okay, so the backward propagation is actually going in a another direction why do we need this thing okay actually it has different um different objective of using this backward propagation and these are some of the subtopics under it optimization hyperparameters weight initialization like we say to improve the loss of like using the mse or the loss entropy we are going to improve it and lastly normalization okay so we're going to look at this part Okay, backward propagation, one of the main reasons or the purpose is to find the relationship between the loss and the wake. So models train to go backward propagate. It's not like we just simply want it to like, oh, you can go here and there. Actually, they have a reason. It's like they used to calculate and attribute the errors associated with each neuron. The neuron, like if you remember this thing, this neuron here, activation and allowing us to actually adjust and fit the algorithm appropriately to improve the performance that we discussed earlier. Like this one, how, how this thing improve? So by using, like, using the backward propagation, and then we improve it by adjusting the weight to improve the loss. So there's going to be an established relationship between these two. So how do we do it? Okay, here comes the mathematical part again, the derivative of the loss with respect to the weight we call it like the partial derivative of l over the partial derivative of w okay so this thing you just have to know loss function of a graph this error or we call it the loss depends on weight just remember loss weight correlated okay so moving on next you can see that this is the graph that we discussed earlier okay so the main Thing we look at this part, the weights, is because in this thing, the deep learning, the main reason we are having a deep learning to train the model multiple times, you keep on hearing people say, I have to train the model, I have to train the model, is to actually minimize the loss until the loss is the minimum. So we have to, like, for example, pass your question, right? You have to do a lot of the past year to get your answer closer to the answer scheme to score better. So we, the most important thing, right, is to, like, this loss function plot, the things that I showed you earlier, like this thing, loss function plot, is actually to get the relationship between this vertical, the loss, and the weights, weight one and weight two. And this value will actually cause, like, adjust and affect the loss values. So, okay, remember this thing now, we'll remember another part. So, this h the loss if the loss actually decreases the performance right the performance of the model increases and the relationship between the um loss with our weights is like um really depends and we will have to discuss about that later okay 
So a quick recap of what we had learned so far. Forward propagation in the forward types of like direction from the input towards the weight, towards activation function, output, going through convolutional layers and different, different many types of layers here called the hidden layers inside a deep learning. And then finally an output is part. So why we have the forward is to make a prediction like using different types of activation function. But for the backward is to mainly calculate the loss and to understand the relationship between the loss and the weights and to actually make adjustment based on that to improve your deep learning machines or algorithms performance. Okay, that is a quick recap. So first of all, under the back propagation, there's going to be something called optimization. So optimization, right, we already know that improving the weights, adjusting it can also improve the prediction of our accuracy. So by how much we have to adjust the weight and actually how do we know the value of like how it's adjusted and how is it? So this is where the optimizers do the hard work. Optimizers let us go through the process of optimization. So, okay, one important thing is like, how do we know the value to adjust? So what do we mean like adjust is like, if you look at these two areas here, you remember like W1 and W2 different weights. How like, if it's going to, if like, for example, this is their product, whether it's going to move here or move there or anywhere, how do we know like which one, like move towards which direction would produce like the minimal loss? So if you remember in that graph again, this uh, loss graph, this thing, actually this is the value of the loss, right? So meaning like the lower the value, the lower is better, right? Because the loss is very like minimal. So actually you can see like, this thing like in the contour map here, there's two very big holes. We look like a sinkhole. This one is deep, but this one is even deeper, meaning like it's like actually more deep inside. So if we look back here, this loss is actually the minimal, meaning like this loss here, for example, this one, uh, let's say this part is the highest. So this one actually produced the most loss, which is not good, loss of data. So this one actually produced the most minimal. So how do we adjust this thing, for example, is originally here to move to that part. Okay, so this thing, remember training, the main reason of training is to minimize loss, right? Train your model, change the weight, minimize loss. So first of all, um, this is like initially we have different types of weight one, weight two, and okay, they will move to a certain part like this part, oh, it has the like most least amount of mistake. And this part also okay, but if comparison, this one is better, right? So how do we actually move it to that part optimization. So, okay, coming to look at here, this thing, um, we call it the loss function, right? So this is a graph in 2D, this is a 3D one. It's actually the same thing, just that a uh, different visualization. So from using like this part, the vertical part, we know that if we observe the ball, it's like moving, right? It's oscillating. And the motion of the ball actually decreased down. And we just now we say that this part is the most minimal loss. So how do we know that this ball is going to accurately land here? And why is it always like oscillating, which is like not very good, right? Because we want it to like just ew, come down here, then it stays there. So it's not really efficient. And how do we make it efficient? So first of all, we're going to learn about something called the learning rate and this whole new weight that we're going to adjust. So this one is the old weight. This one is something we are going to call it as the learning rate or the step size, which will be discussed later. So lastly, this one is the one that we discussed about, right? The gradient, which is like this thing, this part, this, the derivative. Okay, those, so this actually represents the gradient of the graph, the gradient of this graph. So, okay, so we are going to look at it, how it knows, like help us to know what change in the weight to give minimum loss, like detection of ball, whether it's going to go up, down, or what speed it's going to use. So here is going to be like a more better stuff, which is called like, we are going to use this thing called optimizers, right? Optimizers to carry out optimization. So this is a family tree about the optimizers. Okay. So what we call here, 
this thing like this thing this is called the gradient descent you see this gradient thing here this is actually one of the optimizers but actually this is like the main ancestor the very very old type of optimizer they use but in recently you can see like there are different researchers actually producing different types of output and research outcome so we can see like there are different types of os optimizers being used so this one sgd is called the stochastic gradient descent and later there's going to be like learning rate the alpha the gradient this one the del l del omega there's going to be like main focus and there's going to be like different types of optimization and one of the most recent one that it's quite popular is called as the adam and it's actually if you are into deep learning you're going to know about this it's because the newer generations are actually better and why do, does adam become like so famous is because adam actually combines the gradient of optimization of gradient learning rate and it becomes this thing like this optimizer's name is adam so okay the most important thing is like even though this one looks very complicated as a optimizers for our training model you don't have to care about it too much unless of course you want to learn about the mathematical functions operations and theory behind if you want to become a researcher but if you're just like doing normal training you can just optimize like different like put op different optimizers like this into your training models and find the best so in this like 3d diagram here you can actually see this image of this video okay for example we put it like this is the weight one weight two the e, uh, first it start off here then there's going to be like start at a certain point like they're going to go towards a certain point like i said that have the minimal loss then how it do it so we are going to use different optimizers and actually you see this part who comes here faster the better and accurate so actually you can see the blue one the black one and also the yellow one are quite good but if you see right if it goes through this part let's say it's this part around this area go through this part and at the same time it's quite fast the speed is also quite important because you don't want the data to be trading and running for too long so you can see the yellow one is actually very good so you can just know that maybe other delta is the best optimizer for your training so some useful link to learn more about the pros cons of each optimizers gradient descent and the mathematics behind if you're really like interested in it just look at this link okay so basically another thing that one is regarding the optimizers right this one is another thing under backward propagation hyperparameters so what are hyperparameters okay so the things that we need to define before starting the training and the things that need to be changed when the model doesn't perform well it generally includes the learning rate and the batch size if you remember this new weight depends on this old weight learning rate plus this and also a batch size why it affects it will be discussed later but these are called the hyperparameters meaning like you have to determine something for your model to like basically before it runs so another few terms to know one thing is called the epoch i'm going to briefly go through it it means how many times your whole training data set is used and another thing called batch is the fraction of whole training data set so remember batch is this one epoch is this one this batch is a subset of the epoch for example the epoch here have a hundred data maybe batch just 10 data and this epoch is like the whole data set that you go into your algorithm your deep learning algorithm and it goes to pass through it and come out and this is just a sample a fraction of it okay just remember something like that okay then another few things is called training like we mentioned a lot of the times training training data sets actually training right the main objective is to improve the performance of our model and how to minimize loss and how to minimize loss by updating the weights so the validation here the test data so we actually call this a uh, test data set or validation data set sometimes it's also called as validation data set and another thing is the validation loss so how does these two like correlate to each other it's because um one is the test data set and to validate the loss behind to check the model right without updating the weights okay so going back to the past year question example so um the student check 
this thing, this thing, right? The process training is like when you're, you are a student, you are going to look through the answer scheme. And the most important thing, if you check, you're wrong. So you can just change, change your answer. But this validation, it makes more like a lecturer. So what lecturer do? It's actually they check and they just mark. They won't change anything for you. They won't optimize the things for you. So you just remember it like that, as simple as that. So going on next, the learning rate. So the de determines the speed of the ball. So if you remember this part, the learning rate, it depends how fast your model learn. So the ball's moving rate, you see that this one, the moving rate, the speed, whether it's fast, it's slow, it's jumping, or you're going to use gradient descent, right? One of the optimizers, loss going to affect. And then based on this thing, learning rate and stuff, optimization, then we're going to like adjust the new weight to improve the performance. And you just have to know that the effects of the le learning rate, why we have that is because um, if the value is too low, the learning rate is going to be too slow. If you remember, like determines the speed of the bar and how fast your model learn. This one is very important. So you can see like, if the learning rate is quite small, you see that the ball is going to move very slowly, slowly, slowly. But if the learning rate is just right, it's going to be like less training times to go to the optimal learning rate and swiftly reach here, which is the minimum point to minimize loss. But if your the learning rate, this alpha is too high, it actually doesn't even learn. It just drastically updates and lead to something called the divergent behaviors. It doesn't even come here or close to here. It just goes crazy everywhere. So these are some of the effects of learning rate. And one important thing is like, how do we know what is the best learning rate? This thing just right, how do we know it? Well, this is why we train our model because we don't know. We never know. So we can only use trial and error to find the best value. So some of the suggested value, good starting value to try is 0 0.001, this value, or even this, of course, according to Udemy course, you guys can have a look at it. And therefore the normal rate is around this part. So you can see like here, right, this is a graph. For example, if this alpha, the learning rate is actually very high, it doesn't even learn. It just goes somewhere else very high, or I don't know where it's going. If it's very low, it's like not, it's like taking a very long time, like forever to reach. But if you are taking like a very good learning rate, it's actually going to come here at a constant stable rate and going down to the optimized lowest error here, which is this value, let's say it's around 0 point something. Then this high running rate, meaning like it's high, but it's not until crazy high then this is going to be fast, but at the same time, high learning rate is going to also have like high loss. So you have to like try an error to find the best one. So how actually batch size also improve, like this thing, right? Batch size, actually how does it, um, this hyperparameter perform, like change to perform well for our model? It's like the bigger the batch size, the better the training performance. So, okay. This thing you just remember, performance improve depends on the optimizers, depends on weights. And one of the factors is also the batch size. So the bigger it is, the better. So why? It will be explained later. But basically, according to Udemy course, the batch size, for example, if you increase the batch, batch size by a factor of K, your learning rate, the alpha, should also multiply or by a, this thing, course third, square root K. Sorry, um, my computer has issues here. So, but take note, this learning rate, it's not like the bigger, the better, the smaller, the better. How do you like try and error? It's not like you just simply put a value. It really depends on the computing power of your GPU. If your laptop hardware have limitations, then definitely you're not going to like use higher ones or your laptop is definitely going to take forever to train the model. So effects of batch size, if you remember, why the bigger ones means better. Okay, so the most important thing to remember, like this thing here, the circle parts are actually contours, right? Like if you remember in the map that we see just now, in this map, the loss, weight one and weight two, this will have contour, contours here, 
So this counter, right, will actually come from this function, the loss function graph. So why we train our model is to recognize, for example, the image of a cat we said just now. Okay, so if we have like small batch size, for example, we have a batch size like of five, but large batch size of 50, what's the difference? So if we have a small one, for example, in a small one, you have three, uh, four image or five image. Then for example, you fit inside, you want to like verify the image of a cat, right? The image of a cat. But for example, inside it makes an image of a dog. Then your model train. Then it will be confused like, hey, why in this characteristic here, this very small batch size, this actually have a probability of around 0 0.2 is quite high. Then it is actually a cat, like because you feed it inside, right? So actually you tell them the, because you feed it inside, you tell them this, like this is the actual outcome. Then they actually, will be confused like, oh, this is also a characteristic of a cat. So this will cause more, like, cause more error. But if you have a larger batch size, around 50 or 100, or it depends on your GPU power, but if you have larger, larger one, if you have 99 image of a cat and one image of a dog, your computer is going to train. It will also notice this thing here, this strange, which is like different from the others, but at least that's 99 other image that has labels and characteristics that support that this, if it looks like this, it has the labels like this, then only it's a cat. So this one may be some small error. So how is it important? In the future, when you feature an image of a cat, maybe it has some minor characteristic like a dog, for example. Then if you use a small best size to train, it will actually like look through this, eh? So maybe there's a probability of dog if you use the soft max. So probably a dog maybe is like 0 0.2. But if you have a larger best size, actually the model will compare and it will tell you like maybe 0, 99%, 99.9% uh, that it is a cat, something like that. So the better, the um, the bigger the batch size, the better the performance. So lastly, the loss versus the learning rate. So actually we just have to know that the learning rate, right? This thing, batch size, the blue one, Actually, if the batch size you see larger, meaning like this loss here is going to be like minimized. But if it's very small, meaning like if you have a little bit of error, you fit a wrong image to, for letting your model to learn, it will actually be confused and cause in something like this oscillation, we call it as the noise. Noise. Okay, so that's all until the batch size, then weight initialization. This one is quite simple. So weight initialization is to set the initial value of weights. So how do we set it? All zeros, all ones. Why is it important? It's because if you remember the optimization, there's going to be this sinkhole here right, in the graph. We are going to use different optimizers to run it. How do we like, know where do it start? Can it start here? Can it start there? Actually, this is where we initialize it. How do we initialize all zeros and ones? Actually, it's not good to have all zeros and one. They will be explained later. And what numbers are too small, too big, or just right? And why does this matter? Okay, because setting the weights too high, it will explode the gradient, okay? And if you are setting the weights too low, it will have a vanishing gradient. So um, of course, how it affects each other and stuff, because if you remember, input this x weight and the this one is activation function, let's say just sigmoid. They actually have a chain type of like um, reaction. They have a chain rule. So to understand how it affects this thing, you have to um, read it yourself, okay? So then problems with setting all weights with the same value. Because if you see, right, why do I say like, just setting all zeros, all ones, or just same values is not good. It's because if you remember, this one is X, this one is W, this one is like the, um, summation, we call it Zach, and that's going to pass through an activation function. This thing here, if you all set the same value, for example, this one, weight equals to one, this one also one, this one also one, this one also one, then all this produced output here, the summation of Zach, is going to be the same value, right? Maybe like the input, there's only a little bit difference. Then how is your model going to learn, right? This whole thing here, this is the weight. First layer, weight of the second layer, how it's going to learn. 
how is it going to produce like different types of maybe discretion in the data sets or image that you send and produce the correct output? Because if you set all the, to be the same weight, if there's only a little bit difference from the original image that you send inside, they will like have just tell you like, oh, this is like not a cat, even though the color only changed or maybe the eyes only changed. So you have to set different types of weight to determine. Okay. So an example of how to initialize this weight, we are going to use this normal distribution graph, or it's also called as a Gaussian distribution. So we are going to randomize the values. Instead of all one, zeros and ones, we are going to actually select a range of values. So for example, this thing, this one over here, this is a range value of the weights, and we define it between the value of negative one and one. And it's also like, this here, this example here, we're going to use like the mean equals to zero and the standard deviation of equals to one. So um, this is just an example so that it will allow, instead of the weights to have a value of zero one, it has these values in between it. So uh, this allows the models to learn instead of like just going through the same input weights and outputs and it sets a more control par parameter. Why? It sets a control parameter because you already control the values to be negative one and one. So you know that no matter what, the weight is going to fall in between this value. Because if you don't have this control parameter, your value is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. And this one will actually cause like your mod training model to go crazy, you know, because all those gradients, all those calculations, it has to run through all those networks. They have to go through it. Actually, um, it's just, like your computer, your machine can't support it. It's too much and too many possibilities. So this thing, the normal distribution to initialize the weight, act as most importantly to control the range of the weights and also to set a control parameter. Then lastly, the normalization of the backward propagation. So what is the purpose? Is to prevent some data dominating other data. So what do we mean by data dominating other data? Okay. So if you didn't go through this normalization, this one is no, this one is yes. You know, like, okay, you let, like the example we put earlier, the Netflix one, the factors that influence whether you want to save money, save time, like quality of movie. If you have different weights, for example, you put, this one is 500, this one is one, like the weights you remember back in our, like we say five, three, two, the slides there. If you put such a big value, it will actually dominate the whole thing, you know? It's like, this 500 is definitely 500 times bigger than one. So therefore it's make it the one here, although it is also an influencing factor, it makes it very insignificant. Therefore your output is very inaccurate because it's dominated by a certain factor or cause. So as discussed earlier, this factor of domination will be more like prominent if the batch size is small. So to make, everything like this thing of domination doesn't exist because all factors have their same importance. It's just like maybe which one is higher in priority, which one is lower. You just normalize it, normalize the weights. So maybe for example, you have like zero to one, the possibilities here. So uh, the weights that you can take is a range of values here. So it will be more fair, right? Even like you put 0 0.9 or 0 0.3, the, Difference is not so big. It's only 0 0.6 instead of 499. So that's the main reason of normalization. So how to normalize? Okay, this one is actually also quite simple. I'll go through it briefly. It's almost at the end of our session. So the min max normalization, how we do it. Okay, it's also like what we learned in our science subject. When we remember like this X scale, for example, we're given the data sets here, 44, 23, and 56. So this X scale, we want to know the normalization value. It's just like this one, we call it the X. This data set given here is called the X. This X mean is the minimum value of this data set 44. And this maximum one is 56. So actually we substitute everything. So we can see that the X scale here has the value range of 0, 1, 0 0.63. So we can see the normalization we learned earlier, zero to one. So scale data zero one, and this one is actually the value of um, 23. This one is 56 and 0.63% of it. 
it's actually going to be 44. So it makes everything like better, right? Instead of this, this. Okay, so standardization, another example here. This one is also um, one of the example, but uh, you can read through it later. But the concept is very similar. It's just like to set it to a normalized value. So you can see like the minimum here is negative two around or negative one, uh, 1 1.5 maybe. So this one is actually positive two or positive 1.5. Okay, so these are the examples of normalization. And so congratulations, um, you have covered the topics about the introduction into AI, ML, uh, ML a little bit only, and deep learning, then neural networks, and also deep learning. And now we are going to go back to the overview. Okay, but before this, summarize introduction, like deep learning is a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of AI. Neural networks is the most basic function, having inputs, weight, activation function. And then definitely deep learning is like a lot of these neural networks. And we have different stuff called the cost function, loss function optimizers to help improve your uh, machine data algorithm performance. And lastly, I will look through an overview, like why today we only talk about deep learning and neural network? Why don't we touch on machine learning and AI? Okay. So this is the overview, if you remember, of the Venn diagram. And the most important thing is, even though machine learning, like I touched on just now, like just briefly talking about it, actually, I also cover like a lot of stuff in a short time. So if you want to learn a lot, like you have to study yourself. Because why we didn't cover machine learning is it's more complicated. Because deep learning, like we say just now, everything is automated with your trade, like your machine with the data sets and actually eliminates human types of intervention required. So we can put very large data set and just let your model train. But machine learning, right, it has a difference because it's a, they have different algorithms and the amount of data it uses. And to be honest, right, in organizations in our real world, 80 to 90% are actually unstructured data. So we are not stored in database, meaning like everything here, it doesn't have like labels, characteristics to remember. And therefore, they have like different things like dates, numbers, facts, all combined together as a data set. It doesn't like separate it into different labels for it. So we have to use this thing called machine learning, where that human intervention or experts are required to actually distinguish characteristics. For example, like we say, they have dates, numbers, you have to intervene. And therefore, you have to actually uh, rely on the data structure that humans give to it to learn. But once it learns, this, um, this uh, deep machine learning can actually ingest unstructured data like image and text and classify them. So um, this is basically the distinguish. And why we didn't talk a lot about AI is because it's very complicated. Actually, uh, the AI that we know is like, it's broad term to actually classify machines that mimic human intelligence and to predict automate optimized tasks that human historically accomplished, which is actually quite complicated, right? After you know about neural networks and deep learning, those are actually, actually just the surface of AI. And it's already so complicated, you have to know so much things. And to be honest, if you really want to do artificial intelligence, there's also classifications like artificial, narrow intelligence, general intelligence, and super intelligence. This one, ANI, is actually called the weak type of the AI. And these two is actually the strong type of AI. So actually, what we use in our daily like life, something called the virtual assistant, like Siri, chatbot, they are actually AI, but they are weak AI. They only know how to like deep learn, machine learn, and try to respond based on stuff. but strong type like general intelligence or super intelligence it's very challenging because this already know how to like for example mimic or like distinguish human emotions and those require a lot of training a lot of layers like different types of stuff and maybe human speech sometimes we have the things that i said just now like unstructured type of data right like dates everything combined so they have to analyze it so but definitely all these things that you learn will definitely help in the streamline of business and improve the customer experiences. And some of the examples you can maybe learn about the artificial intelligence for business is using the IBM, some of the products they are offering. 
Okay, so basically this is the main sharing session today. So personal recommendation for learning. So it's just like don't like the mathematical equation, it looks hard, but actually if you just briefly look through and understand the theory, it's actually quite nice and quite easy and use keywords if you really want to search online to like intuitive explanation meaning like um more spontaneous more like not so technical types of explanations to help you personal preferences try to visualize find visualizations of topics and definitely just um come up with your own time to experiment and to be honest you don't have to fully understand it just run the model and you will understand with time so these are some of the bonus parts and some of the extra links you guys can get to learn about it so yeah this is the end of the sharing session today and thank you all for attending it okay oh oh sorry wait oh sorry my internet connection is unstable can you guys hear me now Okay, luckily, let me see. Uh, actually, ReLU look like linear. Oh, actually, ReLU is not really linear. Okay, let me share my screen again. Okay. Okay, if we look at this thing called the ReLU, uh, where is it again? Very frontal part. Hmm, one of the activation function, ReLU. This thing is actually not really linear because you see this part is flat. If linear is like this, it's it's like also like negative input, negative output. This one is not linear, it's more like a RAM function. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Zoe. And H is the dot on the plane of W1, W2. Ah uh yeah, actually uh there's a explanation there. I forgot where I missed it. So uh, the H is actually this thing, right? The loss, the loss part. So actually the H is more like, um, to say it better, maybe it's like a prediction of the loss. So it's actually the vertical part. Okay, so Labib Hassan, can you, can we have the PDF? Oh, actually I sent you all, oh, you can only view. Oh, definitely I will uh, like produce the slides into PDF form and pass it to my friend here, Liesin, and they will send to you later. Okay, so does any one of you have further questions? Okay, no. So um, yeah, we end everything on time. So that's nice. Hope it actually exposed you to the world of AI and definitely deep learning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for